Richard C. Hoagland is next with me in just a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. We're not going to have the interview with Robert Bavall tonight. His phone lines are just either clipping out or they're just too bad. However, you know, there's always the wonder of favored guests here on Coast to Coast. And, you know, almost like a baseball coach when you're in the eighth inning and you've got to bring in your top relief pitcher to get everybody out of the game. Who do you call? Well, you call Richard C. Hoagland. <laughs> hey, Richard, how are you? Hi. Uh- George, you're going to owe me one for this. I, I know that. I bet you were comfortable, you were eating, you were ready to go to sleep, and uh, probably listening to Coast to Coast in bed. And... and I didn't even get to the part where Robin showed me this really interesting new green thing she was going to wear tonight. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And uh, I know how you love to prepare for a show. I like preparation, yes. But this time, we're going to dance together, Richard. Uh-huh. Hey, okay, lots buddy. going, lots going on out there. But I don't know if you saw the story about Saturn today that they have found some partial rings. Yeah, ring arcs, like we found with Voyager about thirty some years ago at Neptune. It, it is amazing to me, Richard, how they continue to find these new things out there. Well, you've got you know? a spacecraft the size of a Greyhound bus, unmanned, of course, with lots of cool robots and instruments and cameras and all that. You got plenty of fuel. You're in space where things, technology lives forever. I mean, you know, there are spacecraft orbiting the sun, still relaying data to NASA and JPL that were launched over 40 years ago. That's right. They're still functioning. They're still, you know, so, I mean, there there was a really nasty pre-Gloria Steinem joke that was, you know, told around the Hughes Aircraft Company, which built a lot of the um, early communication satellites. Yes. And it went something like, the engineer said, well... Once you get them into space and out of the way of women's hands, they work fine. (laughs) (laughs) This was a 1950s engineer at Hughes. Oh, that's right. Exactly. They didn't quite understand. Different day, different time, different era, different politics. So true. Yeah, Sarah, don't get mad at me. So true. And now the Chinese, they're going to launch again? Chinese are launching again. They're coming up on their annual anniversary. So, of course, what they're doing is building... Through these launches, a step-by-step compressed timeline, like we did in terms of going to the moon with Mercury and then Gemini and then Apollo, except they've got a much more uh, capable spacecraft. It's a kind of a modified Soyuz that they bought from the Russians and then added to, redesigned, whatever. And remember you and I did a show several years ago when they launched their first Taikonaut, Yes. Chinese for astronauts. And I said that they could take that to the moon at any moment. Yes. We we were baffled at, at least I was, maybe you already knew, at how fast with the latest technology you can go. You know, here we are, we land on the moon in 1969, yet they can do it in just a few short years of being in space and learning space. Technologically, it seems like the, the leap is huge now. Well... Look, history compresses, particularly when you're dealing with follow-on civilizations that do the same thing that a predecessor did. I mean, we did not keep secret how we did Apollo. And building rockets, I mean, remember, the Chinese invented rockets, according to the contemporary history. That's right. So the idea that they could compress the development time to go from Mercury-level flights to Apollo-level flights, is frankly not very, you know, at the edge of the envelope at all. And and I was one who was absolutely expecting they would do this. And we talked on on the show a couple years ago, maybe three years ago, about the fact that uh, the Russian, the the, the Chinese could easily do what the Russians never did now, which is to send a Soyuz with astronauts into lunar orbit and and come home. Not land yet. That's That's a biggie. But going around the moon, going into orbit like we did with Apollo 8, would be a, a major coup. And politically, it's only a matter of time until they do it. They might be going to do it in this window. Are they catching up to us, Richard? Yes, because we're standing still. Yeah, well, that's the thing. We haven't done anything in 40 years that's really worthy of the name. So if they wanted to build, let's say, a newer version of a space shuttle, do you think they could just far surpass what we've got right now? Well, materials moves on, 
and most of the science and chemistry and metallurgy and all that is international. It's not owned by any any one government or any, any one nation. It's at the corporate level, and as you have seen with China and the Silkworm missile and all that going to Iran, you know, they will buy and sell anything from anyone who will sell or buy with them. That's so, true. So the, the, the state of the art for how to get to the moon more efficiently than we did with Apollo is absolutely out there. And we published a tremendous amount of information. And l- look at how we are going about it. We have not invented anything past rockets in the public sector, the shuttle, you know, Saturn-level technology, mm-hmm. J-2 engines, all that. So what we're doing in the president's, you know, vision for space exploration – which includes going to the moon first again and then on to Mars, we're doing it the same way we did it 40 years ago. They are reinventing Apollo, you know, where this is back to the future. Yeah, it really is. And it's nuts. And I'll, just to show, show you how, how, how nuts it is, um, I sent you a note the other day of a news story that um, uh, NASA Administrator Griffin has now ordered an in-house NASA review of the safety considerations in authorizing the shuttle to fly an additional four years right, right. past 2010, because we're going to have a four- to five-year gap between the time that we good night the shuttle in 2010 and the time that the new spacecraft, the so-called Orion... Which has vibrational problems Well, right well now, that's right? the booster. Yeah. The, the, the spacecraft is separate from the booster. They uh, could put it on another rocket okay. and get it up there. I mean, we have two... Major expendable launch vehicles, as they're called, because you throw them away, you don't reuse them. There's the Atlas V and there's a Delta IV, both of which are capable of of lifting this new spacecraft, the replacement for the shuttle, the so-called Orion spacecraft. is supposed to not only go to the um, space station, but also carry astronauts to the moon. If we were to switch from Griffin's decision to build an entirely new launch vehicle from the ground up, used loosely based on shuttle-level technology, except it morphed so that it's no longer based on almost any shuttle technology. A whole bunch of stuff has to be invented, designed, man-rated, all incredibly expensive. We're going to spend in this country in the next projected five to ten years something like $15 billion apiece to develop these two new vehicles called Ares one and Ares five, when in fact in the stable, courtesy of the U.S. Air Force and NASA in previous programs, we have two incredible existing launch systems which could carry certainly the uh, Orion spacecraft to the, to the station and don't have to be paid for. The development money has already been amortized over the normal uh, R&D funding of these programs. And, and what about the black ops programs, this hidden space program that you have That's always... That's a totally separate yeah. discussion. You know, I'm only talking about NASA. Okay. What we think we're spending on NASA. You know, we don't have time this evening to get into the secret space program. And, what do you mean? I, I could keep you here all know. night with me if I wanted to. Say again? I could keep you on here with me all night tonight if I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, we'll nah, just get rid of that, that look, guy. Look, I appreciate I appreciate you doing it. You're, you're going to be with me next hour, and then we're going to let you get some sleep. Okay. Um, which, uh, which, by the way, thank you a lot for this. And like you say, I'll probably owe you, man. <laughs> and I tell you what, owing Richard Hoagland, man, I don't know if I want to get into that, but I'll do it. I'll do it. And next hour, I want to talk with you about CERN too. It's going online in, on on uh, Wednesday of this week. We'll talk next hour with you about that. But you were on earlier with us last week talking about the Rosetta European Space Probe, which was going to go up there and uh, hook up with Steins, the asteroid, which it did. Which Unfortunately, it did. we had a blurry picture of it. Uh, but it is amazing to me that technologically they can send spacecraft, reach a point of a speeding asteroid, get there, either land on it or be right on it. I mean, technology is amazing. The European Space Program, how would you rate its technology to what we have? Well, the, the, the two programs, the, the white program is one that we get to see. The ESA program and the NASA program are basically comparable. I mean, we've done very similar things first to what the... Um, the uh, ESA spacecraft has done. The thing that's really interestingly different is that while NASA puts out a lot of stuff now in real time 
particularly when those of us that were quite vocal around Mars Observer really kicked the traces over and 